biblical perspectives on the news is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Welcome to this week's edition of Ethical Perspectives on the News. My name is Craig Van Sant. I teach at the University of Northern Iowa and hold the David W. Wilson Chair in Business Ethics there. Our topic today is the outsourcing of Medicaid. On April 1st, in just a few days, nearly one in five Iowans will face a new way of accessing health care, dealing now with private companies as opposed to the state agency that they have been using for a number of years. The governor has promoted this shift saying that it is a way to improve health care outcomes, health care access, and save money at the same time. Uh, as we will talk about that today, I want to introduce our panelists to you. With us this morning is David Swenson, an associate scientist in the Department of Economics at Iowa State University. David, thank you for being here. You're welcome. We also have Nicole Tutton, the Health Insurance Exchange Coordinator at Mercy Care in Cedar Rapids. Nicole, really appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. And finally, we have Michael Chevy Castronova, the Sunday business editor for the Gazette, also in Cedar Rapids. Michael, thank you. I appreciate you Thanks being here. Thanks for asking me, Craig. Um, in 2008, I had the opportunity to do a six-month fellowship in Washington, D.C with the Institute for Health Policy Solutions. That is a nonprofit organization that consults with individual states who were trying to expand health care for their citizens and also trying to figure out how to pay for that health care. I should note that when I was at IHPS, it was before the Affordable Care Act or what is commonly known as Obamacare. As I studied health care policy while there, it, it seemed to me that there was a common theme among all of the suggestions on how to go about improving our health care system. One was to expand coverage for more people. Two was to improve health care outcomes. And the third was to save money. Now, in any rational universe, doing all three of those at the same time would be impossible. But I also learned that apparently the way that our healthcare system has evolved, that it is at least theoretically possible to do all three simultaneously. Governor Branstad's effort to privatize Medicaid would appear to me to be an effort to do exactly that. As we talk about this this morning, we want to investigate whether this will actually work well for the people of Iowa, whether it will actually save money, and the ethics of how this process unfolded. Nicole, I'd like to open with a question from you. I understand that you work closely with patients who have Medicaid. Um, I wonder if you could kind of walk us through the system of how it has worked up to this point and then how you see it operating after April 1st. Well, Medicaid currently is a comprehensive health coverage option for folks who meet certain income guidelines. Typically, um, historically, it's helped uh, disabled and, and those with very limited income potential. But Iowa expanded it in 2013 to include working single adults below a certain income level. So I see, you know, folks from all walks of life um, come in and, and they need help with enrolling in Medicaid and, and really making their way through the MCO maze, as it were. Okay, and do you see that changing significantly? I do. Historically, we've worked with IME, which is the Iowa Medicaid Enterprise. 
they've been, you know, very, um, how do I want to say, efficient with a 4% overhead. And now we get to work with three for-profit organizations um, that can have a 15% overhead with their contracts. So. Okay, well that will be an interesting topic to explore. Uh, can I ask a question? Nicole, Please. Iowa Medicaid Enterprise is a mixture, right, of professionals and state workers and who actually is involved in that? That is a good question. I, from my, well, my understanding, I really interface with Lindsay Buchel, mm -hmm. who is part of IME. Um, I believe her background is in social work. So she is employed by uh, the Iowa Medicaid Enterprise, as it were, as far as how that, the organizational tree of that, not visible to that. Michael, do you have some insight into that? I, I think, I, I could be mistaken, um, but I believe in one of the many stories we've been writing about this, I think that it is a collection of folk who are, to use the Midwestern term folks, um, who are professionals, so they're, they're working with the agencies, they're working with the hospitals, they're also state employees, and so I think it's some legislators, and I think they all come together and look at the policy and say, yes, this is good. Okay, which I think sounds, that's right. at, at least on the surface, sounds like what we'd like to see. It sounds like over, oversight. Various parts of society yeah. working together. Um, as I was reading about these issues in preparing for this show, it seemed to me that there are three or four major issues that are of concern. One is the quality of care that patients will receive. Second is the ability to either save money or keep a lid on rising costs. Um, and the third and maybe fourth are the bid process and the companies that were selected and sanctions that other states have levied against them. David, I'd like to turn to you on the economic end and have you talk to us about what we should expect economically from this shift. Well, we look at this from the standpoint of the state's fiscal health. Uh, fiscal health, it, it's, it's basically how much, how much does this cost the taxpayers. Um, one of the things that's always important to understand is the Medicaid is, is, is jointly funded by the state of Iowa and the federal government. The federal government pays a substantial portion of it. Iowa matches that <coughs> with a, a minority portion. Um, over time and historically, health care costs have risen rapidly. Medicaid costs have also risen rapidly. They've risen rapidly for, for a variety of reasons. Um, early on, for example, we added many more children, especially during the Great Recession. We expanded coverage and made sure that more children had access um, during this time period, so our, our numbers went up. Affordable Care Act also increased the number of people, plus we have people um, a substantial fraction of our population who are just simply chronically poor, either that or disabled, and or a combination of elderly and disabled, and they, re they require public assistance. So it, it, it was uh, a substantial part of state government budgeting and a growing component of state bu government budgeting projected to grow quite rapidly over the next 10 years to 20 years. Um, that scares a lot of legislators and it scares a lot of administrators. They see the, the welfare side and especially the health care component of state government um, obligations and responsibilities growing much faster than all other obligations and responsibilities. And as a consequence, they, it, it, it's a political issue as much it is, as it is a practical issue. So as a consequence, and we see this in, in, in many states, especially states that have um, more conservative legislatures, health care is emblematic. Rising health care costs, rising public's obligations for health care, it's emblematic of big government, government out of control, um, government becoming much more uh, either important or intrusive within yours and my lives, 
and they search for alternatives. And, and the alternatives, and, 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 and this is a great example of it, um, and we have many examples in other areas, the alternatives is to look for mechanisms in other parts of the economy. The government is one part of the economy, and the private sector is the other part of the economy. And so governments will sometimes look for um, private sector uh, ingenuity to solve government level problems. I can give you some examples. For example, we, we, we have our, our three major universities here in the state of Iowa and, and you know periodically about every five years they hire a consulting firm to come in and help shake up those universities and get rid of waste and, and duplication and those types of things. It's the same kind of principle that you can either look to healthcare or health health program administrators um, in the private sector and say, look, they've been focusing on cost and, 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 and lowering, lowering cost and, and working effectively with health care management. Um, let's try the private sector to do this. Now, it's, it's all, f and we have it in other areas. We have it in prisons. Fortunately, we don't have it in Iowa, but we have private sectors running prisons. Sure. We, have, we have other kinds of things that have been contracted out by government um, um, to the private sector, either administratively or in direct service provision. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not something new. What it, what, what's, what's new here in Iowa more so than the idea of, of the, the health care management is the speed with which it was sprung upon us. And so then we, we move away from how much of this is administrative and how much of this is, is something else. And, and that, that, that I think leads us to a lot of the conversations that we've had politically about this more so than the practicality of it. Nonetheless, the practicality of it is a great big issue, and you know we just we just heard this whole idea of a profit margin versus an overhead of four percent, and and if 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 the difference is four percent minus fifteen percent, where does that where what's what's that coming out of? And the the obvious argument it has to be coming out of patient care, unless you can make the argument on the other side that what we've had is a lot of waste and inefficiency in government. But nobody's ever demonstrated that. Okay, and if if I understood you correctly, Nicole, mm -hmm. a four percent overhead seems pretty efficient. Absolutely. Um, and I do want to throw some numbers out here so our audience has an idea of what we're talking about. My understanding from reading is that Iowa's Medicaid budget is about four point two billion dollars. Is that right? Yeah. And I got my calculator out and divided that by the number of patients. It's about $7,000 per patient per year, which seems on, on par with other states. Um, Michael, we've heard some about the economic part, the patient part. In the news, can you talk to us about the bid process and how well that seemed to go? Um, you know, one of my favorite newspaper comic strips from a few years ago, it's Zitz, about the teenager. And in the first panel, one of his friends is on a skateboard on a chimney top. And the second panel is a bunch of stars and crashes. The third panel, the friend is lying on the ground. And the main character says, hey, it's not your fault. Nobody saw that coming. <laughs> so we had this process. I believe uh, what we reported, there were 10 bidders to begin with. Four were chosen. Um, we know their names, AmeriHealth, AmeriGroup, United Healthcare, and WellCare. What happened next is where it got messy in that WellCare um, was put on hiatus, as it were, and there were various discussions about whether it should stay in, as you know, eventually WellCare was removed. They fought it and eventually decided to pack up their tents and go. It came down to two points, one being that they did not disclose um, false claim fines from other states, $137.5 million they paid, although they argued, and I you know, you can kind of see the point. They said, well, you asked us, we put it in the documents, you didn't see it, that's not our fault. The other issue that was probably more troubling, I think, for the state was that WellCare hired 
some lobbyists. They hired people as lobbyists. Former House Speaker Christopher Rance and former state representative and more importantly former DHS Department of Human Services contractor Renee Schulte and they had communications with Michael Bousselot who was at the time Governor Branstad's legal counsel and his health expert, he's now the chief of staff. That was in violation of the bid process. So the next thing that happened was that some of the bidders who didn't get in, um, Meridian, Aetna, and I think Iowa Total Care, which might not have been part of that at that time, asked for a new bidding process and said, well, look, this is flawed. You missed this point. You missed that. How did we come this far? Why did you not see this? It went on and on and on, but eventually, as you know, it got delayed. Um, it was supposed to go live January 1 in two months um, after the contracts were signed in October. We're going to Dave's point about this is, looks like a rush. Um, then it was delayed again, and, and now we're going April 1st. Well, Kara said, okay, we've had enough. We're losing too much money here. Because that's the point, too. From their perspective, they're hiring. They're renting space. Um, they're hiring people away from hospitals and, and agencies um, that therefore can't offer the services anymore. They're spending money on advertising and they've been delayed and been delayed. They're losing money too. So WellCare said, we've had enough. Okay. And it's my understanding, and any of you please chime in on this, um, it's my understanding that the three, prov not providers, but the three administrators uh, who are under contract with the state of Iowa now, have had significant sanctions from other states in the last five years. Well, they, well I've read that as well, mm -hmm. and, and we've all read that. It's, uh, it's almost the nature of this industry as they implement their programs in different states. At some point, they end up um, running afoul of either state or federal, more likely federal policies and we do have sanctions but all of the all of the companies um, as I've, I've read in the, in, the, in the accounts all of the companies that have been successful have had sanctions against them so it's the, 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 the Walmart the one that you d just, just described that pulled out yes indeed but so do the other ones um, that is a problem isn't it that if this is a this is a, um, a an industry that's supposed to save the state money yet has a history of I have no other word other than misbehavior. We'll call it administrative misbehavior. It, it, it ends up by you buy you're buying trouble. Well, can I, I can I play devil's advocate yeah. advocate for a second? Mm -hmm. um, being the business editor of the newspaper, um, it's true, and I don't mean to sound crass about it because what these bigger companies will tell you, paying fines is part of the cost of doing business. So sometimes. I think, yes, they violated this, they violated that. I think the issues they got hung up on were canceling appointments without proper notification, failure to notify patients of privacy breach, which is a little scarier, um, tardy processing. Some of these are bigger issues, some of them are smaller issues. There's a Not whole bunch of them. Not signing up pregnant women. Not signing up pregnant women. That's some, a big said, one. Some of them are bigger than others. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, they'll say, yeah, you know what, we're not even going to argue, we'll just pay it and we'll move on. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not justifying it. I'm not saying. I know. Very, yeah. It hurts, though. It does. You, it does. And you know, and we're talking about right, fifty-six, five hundred sixty thousand Iowans who are suddenly being shifted into this. We've got thirty thousand providers who kept saying, "Where are our contracts? What are we signing? What's our reimbursement? What are we doing now?" Well, I'm. You use the term "the nature of the beast." And being a business ethics professor, <laughs> mm -hmm. I have to worry about that. Um, is there something inherent in the administration of health care that lends itself to these kinds of sanctions? Nicole, you work with this on a daily basis. I do, and I see the face of folks who are folks, people, and children and developmentally disabled folks who need help with this. I am, am bound by law to not to steer them, not to show any favoritism as far as Mercy Hospital, the state of Iowa, the federal government. I have to work in that patient's best interest or it's against the law. If there's a conflict of interest, I have to, you know, I'm bound to notify them of that, however slight. 
the Hippocratic Oath that physicians and providers uh, abide by. That's a big deal. That goes above politics, it goes above money and fines because you're dealing with the human life at that point. So therefore, fines are a really big deal to me and lack of service and um, not paying claims for no reason whatsoever, as was done in Kansas by our MCOs, um, it, it's, it's very concerning to me. We'll still, folks will still be able to get services. Um, they're just gonna have to. Well, well I'm gonna, I wanna please. interject here though, Rally because the, 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 point, the point of view that, that it very much needs to be taken is that um, it's the client's point of view and the client's needs. These are, and the people who qualify for Medicaid, a very, very large fraction of the people who qualify for Medicaid are extremely vulnerable um, populations. They need people advocating on their behalf in their interests. It means that for that population, I would argue the state has a higher standard of care than with regard to managing other things that the state manages. And so it should expect that superior standard of care to apply to their contractors. And, and that, that we're back to this fine thing though, that the ethics of that, of that entire process ought to carry over completely to the benefit of the recipients, not necessarily the taxpayers. Amen. Well, you know, that was one of the things we haven't talked about yet, but you're, you're both absolutely right, was the whole notion of when the federal, when the feds, uh, the CMS, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, thank you, um, said, wait a minute, slow down. I think they had 16 points that needed right. to be looked into, and then they said, okay, you're still going to have to wait because you're still not done or ready. And they talked about things such as, do you have enough staff? Do you have enough oversight? And so then you have, not to be partisan about it, but we have Democrats in the legislature who have said, we need more oversight on this because you're exactly right. Who's and some look Republicans. For, and some Republicans, absolutely. And they're saying, who's going to look after these, these very people that Dave is mentioning? Who's going to take care of their sites? Because you've got companies that are, they're, they're, they're for-profit companies. They're there to make money. Which brings up a very basic question that I would like your input on. Private companies have a profit motive. That's the way our economy is structured. Is that compatible with providing a safety net for our most vulnerable citizens? Yes and no, and that's that's the best way to answer it. Yes, there's a there's, great economist. No, to I know one hand or the other hand, but but here's the, here's the deal. There are there are some categories of, of of public goods that may be delivered by effectively using private contractors. The federal government uses private contractors for technology and for rocket development and all manner of things. Yes, indeed, we can use the private sector to do things that the public sector maybe won't excel at, maybe won't be efficient at. But there are other categories where the public sector has a long history and heritage of, of very effective management. They're, they know how to manage prisons. They know how to manage health care. Medicare at the federal level is extremely efficient. Um, and, and, but yet many people would argue, you know, what we need are vouchers and we need to just get rid of the Medicare system, and, and oftentimes it's more uh, a belief system than an efficiency argument, and we end up with politics and ideology as opposed to effectiveness and, and uh, efficiency. Okay, uh, other thoughts? I would argue that the evidence just is not there. If you look at the eth ethical perspective and you also look at the oversight um, that was mentioned, there just is not that oversight with the IME, nor is there any, um, um, you know, if you look at historically with Kansas, um, there was not that oversight there either, and that failed. They lost money. And, yeah, well, no, you're right. I think the, the number was something like the three MCOs in Kansas lost something like $110 million in the first year. So even they didn't, nobody came out well in Kansas. And mm -hmm. we're here in Iowa where the testimony has been, in the first six months, the state of Iowa, by privatizing, will save $51 million in the first six months. But yet we now know, on further, with the follow-up questions, um, they said, well, we don't know that it's $51 million. We got several estimates, so we picked the number in the middle. And as yeah, I so. understand it, they 
they have no documentation of the estimates right. that they that's have. true and and and, and these, folks, these folks are absolutely right. I mean, we've done some, Chelsea Keenan, our healthcare reporter, has done some stories talking to these folks, and it makes, you, it makes you cry. I mean, these are heartbreaking stories about these folks saying, what are we going to do? You know, the, the $51 million, to put it into uh, perspective, is a little over 1% savings. 1% savings. You're not talking about uh, even uh, you know a double or a triple. We're talking about you know, <laughs> Single. a, a bunt hit. <laughs> it's it's not that big of a deal, yeah. and we don't know that that number is right. Right, and you compare mm -hmm. that. We're talking about fifty six thousand beneficiaries. That's what a fifth of the population mm -hmm. of the state. Yeah, it's about that's 20%. a lot of people. Yes. Um, time is slipping away. I really appreciate your input. What I'd like to ask each of you at this. Point. Nicole, I'll ask you to go first, is what should our viewers know as they turn off the TV set? What should we leave them with? Our viewers, our viewers should know that we will get through this um, as more is being pushed on the health care providers. Um, I would really encourage people to find their primary care provider, get, you know, get your physicals, um, you know, make them a partner in your care. This is for everyone. And, um, you know, use their network that they're affiliated with because they have resources out there that will help you find your way. Mercy Hospital is a great example. We have folks on staff to help um, patients with healthcare literacy um, and health coverage literacy as well. So that's okay. what I would encourage them to do. Great, thank you. Michael, let me ask you the same question. Sure. Uh, the doctors, the nurses, the case managers, those folks who went, the pharmacists who went into this business are still in this business. Mm -hmm. They're still there primarily to help you. And they're still there. And they're still there to help you. So seek them out and, and ask them questions. And, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, okay. But yes, they're still there. They'll still help you. Okay. And David? Yeah, this is, uh, um, this is a piece of public policy. If you care about this public policy, um, it deserves to be followed. It deserves to have legislative oversight. It deserves um, scrutiny. We need to make sure that, that, that the promises that were made um, are kept. And if they're not kept, if it requires amendments, whether it be administrative, um, that's going to come more so from clients and citizen oversight than it will be from administrative decisions. So this is still a big, important public policy topic. We need to pay attention to it and see how it plays out. Okay. And Michael, let me come back to you on that, again, being in the news business. Once this is set in place, April 1st passes, we have the first several articles about how it's going. Is this something that will stay on the radar? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've seen it being debated on the national level. We've had our national candidates have been through here and they've been talking about health care and they point to Iowa and say, look what's going on there. We'll see how that goes. So absolutely, um, we'll continue to write about it. We've got a series that we started about a month okay. ago, two months ago, called Managed Care Year One. We have another story on April 3 and throughout the year we'll have stories, Great. we'll have them online, we'll have video following how this goes. That, great, thank you. Thanks to all of you. On behalf of the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for being here and providing this very informative discussion. I'd like to thank you, the viewers, for watching. Have a good week.